The hinge for Stephen Hall's design of the campus expansion is the Cullen Garden, designed by Noguchi and opened in 1986. Now, almost 35 years later, it's beautifully matured. The trees have emerged as these glorious entities. You see the different planes that Noguchi established using different cues from the history of art to establish these forms. And the great thing is, is that Stephen Hall has taken many of his cues for the Glasshouse School of Art and the Kinder Building from the forms that Noguchi built in 1986. I'm at the base of the Glasshouse School of Art beneath the ramp. In fact, there's an amphitheater, an outdoor amphitheater just above my head, concrete slab, and then of course the beginning of the tunnel into the Kinder Building. At each entrance and exit to our campus, we've placed important works of art, again to signal our mission to bring works of art to the community. This work is by Ai Weiwei, this extraordinary dragon. Like so much of Ai Weiwei's work, this dragon is a marriage of the old and the new. Not only the ancient image of the Chinese dragon, but also the materials, bamboo and silk, which for millennia have been standards of Chinese manufacture. I'm in the McNair Education Court, where each year 50,000 students will alight from their yellow school buses, descend this magnificent stair, and enter this extraordinary tunnel designed by Oliver Eliasson. It's a piece which is activated by light and our presence, our retinas, and our brain. Because outside the tunnel, of course, everything appears yellow. But right now, inside the tunnel, my brain can only perceive black, white, and gray. And when we emerge on the other side, it will be like that scene in The Wizard of Oz where they arrive at the Emerald City and everything suddenly is in brilliant color. So now we're in the Cherry and Jim Flores Tunnel and it was designed by Carlos Cruz Diaz who unfortunately passed away a year ago. It was conceived before his death and realized posthumously. It operates on a very different principle from that of Oliver Eliasson's tunnel. And in this tunnel, we can only perceive the color with which we're being bathed by these lamps that Carlos Cruz Diaz designed, whether it was blue, magenta, or green. I'm leaving the Flores Tunnel and entering the Kinder Building, a vast space beneath the Hamill Foundation Plaza. And here we've placed another extraordinary work of art, which was not commissioned for the building, but acquired for the building. This is Asa Oke by Martin Purrier. It was a standout work in his display at the 2019 Venice Biennale. And it looks like the Liberty Cap, which of course symbolizes for us American freedom. It also happens to be the shape of a Nigerian cap called an Asa Oke, which is a ceremonial cap or even a crown, which has become a symbol of African independence. But it's made in the form of netting the kind of netting that was used uh, in the holds of ships that transported enslaved people. This is the Lynn Wyatt Theater. Lynn Wyatt, native Houstonian, philanthropist, who was one of the co-founders of our internationally renowned film program. So now we once again ascend from the terrestrial to the celestial sphere as we enter the Kinder Building to approach the Cornelia and Meredith Long Atrium which is animated by this extraordinary mobile, the International Mobile by Alexander Calder. Calder conceived and created this mobile for the Philadelphia Museum of Art for their grand hall in 1949. They were unable to buy it, but happily in the early 1960s, our museum did. And this mobile has hung in every one of our buildings and spaces. It was only halfway through the design process that I thought perhaps the mobile could look nice in the long atrium. Stephen Hall embraced the idea, but it was only a few weeks ago when we hung it for the first time, could we see how resonant its forms and structure and even the color are with the spaces that Chris McVoy and Stephen Hall have conceived. This is one of our three Main Street galleries that have full plate windows onto Main Street. They'll be illuminated at night and anyone passing down Main Street will be able to see what it is we do here in the Art Museum. We show works of art. This room is devoted to the works of Jean Tangley, Nicky de Saint-Fall, 
Soto, other South American artists who were interested in motion, kinetic activity, as the basis for the construction of works of art. There's one work in here that I have a particular attachment to. It's called Metamatic by Tangley. It was made in 1958. It was acquired by the museum, I think, in 63. And in 65, I remember quite distinctly as a child being taken by my mother to Cullinan Hall across the street and being mesmerized by this work of art. This is an exceptional work by Tunga, the Brazilian artist who passed away last year, who created a mythic fairy tale about two conjoined twins united by their hair, as you see here reflected in the iron and copper strands displayed on the floor. Adjacent, we have a work by Anthony Caro, completely different and unusual for a sculptor to have color play such an important role in the conception of his works of art. So we call this Gallery Zero, and it's where we've displayed our works that don't depend on natural light to come alive. This is an amazing installation by Julia Cosice, an Argentinian artist who conceived, starting in the 1940s, an extraterrestrial world. As you see, using plastic, which was a new medium at the time, to create these, not spaceships, but galaxies and places for human habitation. You see tiny representations of humans uh, throughout, imagining what it's going to be like to explore space some 20 years before we actually did. This is the gallery in which we begin to tell the story of modernism as it developed in Europe and the Americas in the years immediately preceding World War I, 1914. It was an international phenomenon, new ways of seeing and thinking that was picked up by artists in all the world capitals. And we've reflected that in this installation by including works by Americans, Henri Matisse, the Romanian Constantin Brancusi, the Italian Modigliani, who were all grappling with new ideas for expression in the early years of the 20th century. And in this gallery, we show a high point of modernism, which is reflected in the commissions by Nelson Rockefeller, 30 years old, for his apartment on Fifth Avenue, in New York in the 1930s, in which he asked artists of great fame, Henri Matisse, Fernand Langer, to decorate his living room. And the work of art here is exceptionally important in the history of our institution. It's made by John Biggers, an artist, African-American artist, who had just arrived in Houston, I think 1949 or 1950, to teach at Texas Southern University, a historically black university. It won the art prize in our annual art competition that year. But because he was black, he could not attend the prize ceremony. And our director then, James Chilman, used that shame in order to desegregate the museum long before the city had. For 20 years, Mary Carmen Ramirez, who's Wortham Curator of Latin American Art, has been building the most important and comprehensive collection of Latin American modernism north of the equator. And here it is finally installed in all of its glories. And we have galleries devoted to Brazilian art, where I'm standing now, Argentinian art, Uruguayan art, the School of the South, to show the multiplicity, the complexity, and the glory of modernism south of the border. These works were all made by students in the TTG, Taller Torres Garcia, students of Joaquin Torres Garcia, this extraordinary Uruguayan artist, in order to inspire artists to work with humble materials in order to make extraordinary works of art. The second floor atrium is the perfect place to contemplate Christina Iglesias's pool. It's extraordinary and unlike anything in North America. We're particularly proud of our holdings in decorative arts, design, and crafts. And more than most encyclopedic museums in, in the United States, we focused on these disciplines uh, in order to create comprehensive collections of 20th century art. Of course, we have primary examples of many of the major iconic designs of, of the 20th century, such as Mies van der Goes, a chair that was made for the Barcelona Pavilion. And what I particularly enjoy is this ensemble of works produced in Vienna at the turn of the 20th century by members of the Wiener Werkstatt. We have about 8,000 works on paper in the Museum of Fine Arts Houston collection. Of course, we have to have lower light levels for the works on paper, and they represent European American and Latin American modernism of the 20th century. 
works by Matisse and Picasso and Diego Rivera, as well as American modernists like John Marin, Native American works, Oscar Bloomer. We're very proud of the diversity of this collection. Eva Hesse, German-born American artist who tragically died at age 34, is known for her work in ephemeral materials, but in fact, she also made beautiful watercolors such as this. Our collection of photography of European, American, South American, Polish, Japanese is absolutely exceptional in our country. Most of the works in this gallery have been acquired by curator Malcolm Daniel in this new large format, which is indicative of photography of the last 20 or 25 years. And we have works from the very dawn of photography, 1839, 1840, into works made in the last couple of years, like this extraordinary mural by the South African artist, Zanelli Muholi. I want to turn our attention for a moment to, I think, the earliest work, or the next earliest work in this gallery. It's by Vincent Chevalier. It's a view taken from the Pont Neuf in Paris. Uh, all of you who love Paris will know that bridge. And it's view of the Seine and uh, the Louvre on one side. It was made within a year of the invention of photography. It's made out of silver molecules deposited on a plate of copper. And it is of such high precision that at extraordinary magnification, one can see at the far end of the Quai du Louvre, a man asleep on a bench. So now we're on the third floor of the Kinder Building. And one can experience for the first time the lighting system that was developed by Chris McVoy and Stephen Hall for our building. It's probably unique. It has clerestory lights in the roof, which admit both northern and southern daylight, mixed with artificial light to create this very pleasant ambiance. Politics, civil rights, social justice are important themes of the art of the second half of the 20th century. And that is reflected in this particular installation with works by Richard Avedon of the Chicago Seven, Kara Walker, Doris Salcedo, Robert Gober. This suite of galleries is devoted to a formal theme, color into light. That's pretty obvious in this first gallery. There's a, there's a lot of color going on, whether they're by Fontana or Stella, Donald Judd, Kenneth Nolan. We've also included European, American, and South American artists. Of course, Joseph Albers' homage to the square is a fundamental work of the, of the mid 20th century and resonated throughout the Americas and in Europe. And we see that dialogue with artists around the world in this installation. The Swiss artist Paul Klee once described a line as a dot that went for a walk. And that, of course, is emblematic of the gallery here. It was inspired by the collection we have on deposit of the works of Gego, Gertrude Goldschmidt, South American artist of German origins, who made these marvelous works in space out of thin elements of wire. But she wasn't the only one. For example, we have this work by the Japanese American artist, Ruth Asawa, uh, so beautiful in its forms, but also in its shadow that it casts uh, on the pedestal below. This gallery is called Laugh Out Loud, L-O-L, and it includes our famous soft fan by Klaus Oldenburg, pointing to the absurdity of modern contraptions, to the works of the Campagna brothers, which create soft toys and dolls, again, making an ironic rift on contemporary design, as well as the extraordinary photographs of William Wegman and his Weimar honors. The works in this gallery are made by groups of artists or made out of diverse materials, and, and, and the display is called Collectivity. One of the great ones is by Nick Cave. Nick Cave created uh, in the second decade of the 21st century works which he called sound suits. He liked the idea of masquerade. He liked hiding inside that suit because as an African-American, no one could tell who I was, whether I was a man, whether I was a woman, whether I was black, or whether I was white. They're absolutely fantastical structures. Stephen Hall likes to think of his practice in architecture as sculpting space with light. And he does so beautifully here in this building. And as a result, sculpture resonates in these spaces. And I like this angle where one can contemplate the extraordinary mobile by Alexander Calder, the international mobile of 1949, the amazing standing woman by Giacometti, 
early 1960s, and the recent works made by Byung Hoon Choi, Korean sculptor, just below. Thank you so much for joining me on this tour of the Kinder Building and our collections of modern and contemporary art. I hope you enjoyed it, and I can't wait to see you here in Houston.